our scripture and the message basis in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 8. Now that's one of those little books that you may not find readily. If you're not familiar, go to the book of Daniel. Make a right and you'll come to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 8 is within the context of this scripture as God speaks to the nation of Israel. He is come to declare judgment upon that land. Judgment, would you note, upon the people of God. You say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. Why would God judge his own people? Why would God allow terrible things to happen to his people? Why would God allow an oppressing government to come in and overrun them? Why would he allow them to die in battle? Why? And the answer is because they have turned from God because they have turned to pagan gods, because they have become idolatrous. They are worshiping at the idol gods of this world. And now God says in verse 8, or pardon me, in uh, verse 7 of chapter 8 of Hosea, for they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. I'm fascinated by weather patterns, especially those things like tornadoes. If I was younger and didn't have a family and had just a little less sense than I've got, I might be a tornado chaser. I tell you, I like to see those things rumbling across the prairie and, and watch all of those things being sucked inside and blown apart and all of that kind of thing, and, and it's just fascinating to me. They have sowed the wind. Now, we've all been in windstorms. Have you ever been in a tornado? Some of us have come mighty close, haven't we, Joseph? Brother Joseph Skipper and I were seated in my office when it was over in the administration area of our church, and uh, we were just visiting and talking, and it turned dark, and it began to rain as hard as I've ever seen it rain in all of my life, and we're just sitting there saying, boy, I can't hardly see the street from here. It's just raining so hard. And about that time, my telephone rang, and my wife, frantic on the other end of the phone, said, you need to come home. I said, it's raining. <laughs> she said, the windows are about to blow out of the house. I said, don't stand in front of one. <laughs> Good advice. And in just a minute, the rain was gone and the wind was gone. But what I didn't know until a few minutes after that was that a tornado had come through our neighborhood and it had knocked down trees and twisted up all kinds of things and, uh, and knocked trees down behind our house and one of them fell right beside of my boat. Now that was bad, but if it had fallen on my boat, that would have been a major catastrophe, I want you to know. And it sat down, but it lifted up and went over our house and over the church and sat down again just a little ways over here and then lifted up again. I'm fascinated by seeing them, but I don't like the idea of being inside of a tornado. They have sown the wind they shall reap the whirlwind. America is a nation turning their back on God, how are sowing to the things of this world. Right now they're telling us that we have the most storms ever recorded in the month of July, hurricanes that are coming across. Some of you remember the night that Hugo hit. Oh, I remember it well. I could detail for you where I was and the events that were going on and the howling of the wind and the way that the roofing was stripped off of the church and how the tornadoes sprung out of that thing and one twisted the top 
of a tree out right in my front yard and, and the top of a tree behind the church. And, and I thought, Lord, had it not been for your hand, greater damage could have been done. But we have watched in recent weeks as hurricanes have come across and they have come through and struck Florida and Alabama and that general area in the Gulf. And even right now or there about this moment, a hurricane, a strong hurricane, perhaps even a Category 5, is slamming into a portion of Mexico and bringing with it devastation, bringing with it great physical harm and property damage. And we watch all of these things as they develop. A hurricane, by the way, begins with an atmospheric low pressure center that begins then to gather strength as it sucks heat and moisture out of the ocean. And as it moves across those ocean waters, it just intensifies more and more. As it intensifies the wind force, the low pressure itself begins to intensify. And the common phrase is, the greater the low, the greater the blow. And so these storms, bringing moisture and other things, they set themselves such as Hurricane Andrew did just a few years ago as it came with its winds registered at the time of 155 miles an hour, but later declared to have been blowing winds of in excess of 200 miles an hour and came across the peninsula of Florida and ripped it apart as it made its way on across then to throw itself against Louisiana. The greater the low the greater the blow. May I say to you, there's a sinful wind blowing through this land. In our day, it seems that our nation's morals have dipped to a monstrous low. Evidence is becoming more and more compiled, revealing that our moral society is being controlled by wine mongers, whore mongers, and war mongers. Wherever this wind blows, it's destroying hearts and self-esteem. Its costs are astronomical in disease and death and human suffering at all levels. This evil wind has stricken with theological shame, with sexual shame and social shame. Sin is a word that has outlived its usefulness according to more than 25% of America's male population. Old-fashioned preaching and holiness of living have fallen on hard times. Soul-stirring music that rang from the heart and declared a church's faith has been re replaced with rock and roll ditties that neither stir the heart nor glorify God but appeal to the fleshly appetite of the unregenerate church members. Can I get an amen? There's a sinful wind blowing through the land. Faith has faltered. Worship has been replaced by entertainment and the house of God is forsaken. We have sown to the wind and we're reaping the whirlwind. The greater the low, the greater the blow. What are some of the signs of this sinful wind? There is the sign of theological shame. My brothers and sisters, I want you to know that if you study the situation of the church world today, you will be appalled at what you learn. I've just been told within the last two days that the majority of one of the major denominations in America is changing its charter, its theological uh, declaration, to say that uh, they do no longer confess that Jesus is Lord because most of their priests do not even believe in God. Neither do they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I ask the question, why in the world would any man say that he is a pastor or a preacher and yet he does not believe in the, the, uh, the truths of the Word of God? Why, that not only is... Uh, is theologically unsound, but my friend, that is theological hypocrisy at its height. 
That's a man robbing a people out of their money and doing so without a gun. And he's using things of words and other things in order to bring people astray. Sin is a word we don't need anymore. I have read and reread the uh, interview with one of America's most well-known preachers recently on television. He made these statements and he was asked what he said about what he believed about and how he preached about sin. He said, oh, I never used the word because we don't want to offend anyone. I got news for you, friend. If God said it, it's settled, and anybody who will not stand and proclaim that men who are without God are lost in sin and people who are engaged in sinful practices are headed to a devil's hell, that man ought to get him a job. He ought to start selling insurance or digging ditches or doing something else that is worthwhile and get out of trying to dupe people into believing that as long as they are good and kind and as long as they don't do anything to offend anybody and if they love their children and put bread on the table that they're going to heaven, I got news for you. It's just not going to be that way. Without Jesus in your heart, without your sin under the blood, without your soul that has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, it's going to be a long, hot season where you're headed. You'd better get you a fan in your hand and an asbestos suit where you're going is not going to be comfortable. There's a sign of theological shame. Everywhere I look anymore, I see men of God, quote, unquote, people who have claimed to be pastors and leaders of denominations who are leaving their lives like broken dreams scattered alongside of the roadsides of life where they have traded their, uh, their position for a, a few moments of pleasure in some sleazy hotel or in some hidden dark place where they have committed adultery and brought shame upon the name of God. It's a sign of theological shame. The greater the low, the greater the blow. Then there's a sign of sexual shame. Child molestation. Is there any more horrible sin than that when a man or a woman would take advantage of an innocent little child? I tell you right now, just bring them on down. I'll do my best to whip them while I can. And if I can't, I'll hire some of you to come to my aid. But I'm telling you that people who are uh, in a lifestyle of child molestation has become now the accepted norm of our time. Let me tell you the flip side of that. In 1965, I became a pastor. By 1967, as I studied the Word of God, I began to see some of the things that God said was coming upon the earth. And I began to tell people this. I said, I will live to see the day when homosexuality will become an accepted lifestyle. Some of my people said, Preacher, you'll be all right when you get out of the sun. I, that can't possibly be. But I've lived long enough that I can tell you that that's the way it is today. And I said, I will live long enough that I will see when, uh, when a, a man having relationship with his own child will also be an acceptable lifestyle. And I hate to say it, but I've lived long enough that it has become common enough that I want to say, Lord, I wish I had not known what you said was coming upon the earth. But we're seeing it more and more, and the government acts as if its hands are tied, and men sit on their hands saying there's nothing we can do while they lose little girls into their homes and they molest them over and over and they put them in sacks and bury them alive outside of their houses and when they kill little boys and bury them in the far reaches of the mountains and the world sits by and says, ho oh, hum, that's not happened at my house. It may happen there next week. You'd better get your gun and be ready. It's coming. We're living in a world of sexual shame, child molestation, perverse sexual perversion. We're living in the fulfilling of Romans chapter 1 when Jesus said that in this time men would begin to burn in their flesh men for men 
and women for women. But may I go ahead and tell you that the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy spells out, and if it was a problem then, you know it's worse now, that we are accepting bestiality when people are becoming worse than animals and they're beginning to act that way and we're again just standing by and saying there's nothing that they can do. I can't get involved. Why, if I do, it'll cost me my, my position or it'll cost me some time and I might have to make an investment money Monetarily. I want you to know that when God's people sit down and do nothing, the devil's crowd rise up and take over. And we're living in a day of the sexual perversions that are come upon this land of ours. By the way, there are churches, quote unquote, Thank God it's not that way here and will not be as long as I'm pastor when uh, there are churches that are putting their approval on premarital sex saying that it's just normal. That's the way that people are. There's a Greek word that describes my reaction to that. Baloney. Yes, there is no way that that can stand in the sight of holy God where once boy, girls and boys were taught and believed in purity of their bodies and in coming to the marriage altar as virgins. Now even more churches are making room in their belief system for premarital sex. There's a sinful wind blowing in the land. Who would have believed that in this, the Bible belt of America, we would have allowed some of the things that we have in our section of the world today? Who would have believed that you can ride down the streets of our city and see uh, the signs that say here there's topless dancing and prostitution. By the way, if you haven't done so lately, I challenge you to get your telephone book and look up uh, what escort service and see how many pages there are in your telephone book. And I want you to know that that is just another word for prostitution. Don't look at me like you're shocked. I know that you know better than that. And of course you understand that. And yet we sit by and we say, oh, uh, this is just people who are coming from outside of our region and they expect that kind of thing when they come here. They come to play golf, get drunk, and run around. They may have that in mind. But don't you think it's time that the church at least said it's not right. Do you remember a few years ago when your pastor and a few others led the fight against topless dancing in our county and how some of us were maligned? And do you remember that one of the owners of one of those places wrapped herself in an American flag and said that she had the right to uh, have that in her club if she wanted to and said that she was a member of a church? And if she was, I know the name of the church. It was the Laodicean church. That's where she was a member when they have shut Jesus out and they have let the devil and all the practices of this world come in. There's a sinful wind blowing in the land. Who would have ever believed that pornography would be a mainstream American business where women, children, and perversion would be sexually glorified where people would be dehumanized and politicized and then marketed on the corner grocery store magazine shelf and in the living rooms of American homes and where people who are good people are sucked into a situation that is damaging to the mind to the point that it involves the whole of their human being. My brothers and sisters, hear this. One of the biggest problems that we have in America today not just for young people, but for some of us who are in the senior years and it's happening with pulpits over and over and over again, that internet pornography has become the sites that men are going to repeatedly and they are destroying their thinking processes and they can't look at women in a, in a wonderful way, but they look at them with a perverted understanding of what humanity is all about. There's a sinful wind blowing in the land where women once blushed when they were exposed to shame. Now they're ashamed if they blush. Who would have ever believed that men who openly 
have womanized and adulterated their marriage vows would claim a successful public career and even aspire to the presidency of the United States. There's a sinful wind blowing in the land and the greater the load, the greater the blow. From the scandals that we have in our United States House and Senate to the sad stories of battered wives and abused children in the house next door. From Wall Street to Main Street, drugs and alcohol, abortion and abuse, crime and corruption, legalized infanticide that we call abortion, suicide, and now euthanasia is looming on the horizon of our tomorrow. Man, we are in a mess. There's a sinful wind blowing in the land. But nothing is more shameful than the theological shame, the forsaking of the house of God, and the embracing of the world by a corrupt church. If I stood and told you some of the things I know that are going on in the name of God and in the church, you would not believe. But I'm telling you, my friend, you ought to get on your knees and thank God that you were born or that you live in Conway, South Carolina, that you're a member of an old-fashioned Baptist church with a leather-lunged preacher that don't know the difference between a clock and a calendar and believes in preaching hell hot and eternity long and the blood of Jesus Christ is the only way for the redemption of sin and souls. Amen. What is the only shelter from the storm? It is not houses that are poorly built. Jesus gave us the parable, you remember, of the two houses. He said there was one man who built his house on the sand, but another who built his house on the rock. And when the rains came and the floods came up, that the house that was built on the sand fell. And I'm telling you that in our world today, the houses that are being built on all of these things that we are seeing around us and where they're being built on sexual and fleshly attractions and when they're leaving God out, I promise you that those homes are going to fall when the test of time comes. But those who build on the rock, the rock of ages, those who anchor their souls in the church, those who pray together, do stay together. And we know that God will keep us in that time even though the winds blow against us, those homes that are built on the rock will stand. Back in my young days, when I was but a boy, I can remember my mother and dad telling me of the tornado that came through the community just adjacent to ours. And there it was in that one place a little mother who had a half a dozen children. And they saw the storm coming, nowhere to run, and that mother grabbed those children and got them in a closet and shut the door and began to pray, God, please take care of us. God, don't let this storm kill us. Lord, take care of my children. And the storm hit, and it hit their house. And that house was obliterated. And the only thing that was left standing when the storm was gone was the closet where those, uh, that little family had gathered. And I'm telling you that when you anchor your home on the rock of ages and you put prayer into the hearts of your family and when you pray God's protection down upon you and when you cover your house and your family with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and when you pray a thorny hedge of protection around your children, though the devil may come against you, I tell you that the devil will be defeated and God will leave you as victors in your world world. There's a sinful wind blowing in this land and we need to make sure that we have built our homes on the solid rock. This sinful wind began blowing in Eden. It continued till it blew over Sodom and Gomorrah and now it has gathered new strength and is sweeping across America. Can I give you just a few statistics that may be a little bit dated but they'll tell you what I want to say. These are from the Department of Corrections of the United States government. 90% of the inmates on death row were abused as children. 20% of inmates entered prison with mental health problems. 50% of inmates are functionally illiterate. 80% of inmates have substance abuse problems. 80% of inmates were unemployed. 
60% of inmates, 60% uh, of Department of Youth Services clients graduate to adult corrections and an increasing number of pregnant women are being incarcerated. Some projections at the current rate of incarceration, $350 million more a year will be needed to build prisons and a billion dollars more will be needed for annual operation of those prisons. You would think that we'd figure out that it's cheaper to keep people out of jail than it is to put people in jail. But I'm telling you now that we need to figure out that there's some people that ought to be locked up and throw the key away. They should never get out onto the streets again. They're saying now that one of the largest employers in the state of South Carolina is the Department of Corrections. And it costs as much to keep a person in jail for a year as it does to send that same person to Princeton University. And they're saying soon, as much as 80% of all job applicants will not be able to fill out their job application when they go seeking employment. Friend, it, it's a terrible land. It's a terrible day. And it's because I believe that we have sown to the wind and we're reaping a whirlwind. What is the answer? Well, the first answer, of course, is to give your heart to Jesus and to live holy. My friend, hear me. If I were to ask for a show of hands and ask how many of you will say, I know deep in your heart, I've been born again. I would not hesitate to say that 99 and 44, 100 percent of us here tonight would say, I know I've been saved. But how many of you are living holy lives? How many have allowed things that have come into your world that are not godly? How many of you have embraced things that a few years ago you wouldn't have thought about touching? How many of you are listening to and telling things that you know are ashamed before God? How many of you have said, well, I, I know that's bad, but I, I just, I want to love everybody. I want to love everybody too. I want to love enough so that I can tell them that without Jesus, they're lost and on their way to an eternity without God. What can you do? Give your heart to Jesus. Live holy. Sacrifice to maintain your faithfulness to the worship and work of the church. Get your children saved and then teach them right. Take a stand for God in your home, in your community, and at the polling place, by the way. There's a sinful wind blowing in the land, but those who are built on the rock will stand. I want to be like Joshua. I've got it on my door at home. But I hope it's not just printed on my door. I believe that it's printed on the door of my heart. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. By the way, for whatever it's worth, and this ain't worth much, but it means a lot to me, there's not an ashtray in my house and hadn't been for a long, long time. Well, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Not only that, if you come to my house and we eat together, we pray together. If you come to my house, we talk about the things of God. We are built in a home that I'm telling you now, me and mama's getting old. And somebody looked at me not long ago and said, Preacher, you are using the wrong verb. You're not getting old, you are old. <laughs> and I guess it's what perspective you're looking from. But I'm telling you that whatever days I've got left, I want to give them all to Jesus. I want to say that this is not my house. I'm just using it because God has granted me the privilege. The car I drive may be in my name, but it belongs to God. And everything that I am and have or hope to be, I want to know that it is centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. Years ago, while I was a student at North Greenville College, well, I'll give you the name of the church, Double Springs Baptist Church. Rural church in those days, city has moved out to where it is today. Called a new pastor just out of seminary. It was one of those good churches like Langston. 
It was a church that believed in the book and where people felt at home to say amen. And if you gooch two or three of them, they'd shout. It was a good church. But the new pastor came in and his second Sunday, he preached a message. Why? I am a dry eye. And in his sermon, he said, as long as I'm pastor, there'll be no crying in this church. As long as I'm pastor, there'll be no place for shouting. As long as I'm pastor, there'll be no amens. I will deliver the message and I'll pronounce the benediction and you'll go home. They didn't have enough guts to vote him out. But the church split. And many of the good people left. And the church began to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. There's a sinful wind blowing in the land. Now, I've said that to say this to you. My brothers and sisters, there's some things that you must protect at any cost. And there are some things that it's worth dying for. But there are some things that are worth living for. And you need to give your whole heart and your whole life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was in the 1850s when America hit one of its lowest places in its history. Per capita consumption of alcohol was at an all-time all -time high. Does that sound like our day? Their economy was in such shape that they were facing a total collapse when they would go into a depression. They knew that these things were on the horizon. It was a time when the nation was being torn apart over debate politically over the race issue and where states were beginning to say, we're going to go our own way. And our nation was being torn apart. It was in that time that a new president came to the White House, but he didn't have the answer to America's needs. It was in that time when one of the mainline denominations had already issued what they call their halfway covenant. And in that covenant they said that any child who is born into a, uh, one of our homes is already halfway to the kingdom of God. And all they have to do is to learn the catechism and they'll automatically become Christians. And they added to their church roles thousands upon thousands of thousands of names of people who had never had any kind of conversion experience. And it was in that time that God sent Jeremiah Lampere to New York to begin revival, uh, prayer meetings for revival that would ultimately sweep across the country. Probably as the thing that saved America was a reviving hand that came from heaven down upon this land. It did not do away with the war between the states. It did not do away with the millions who died. It did not do away with the heartache that came to this land. But anybody who understands history will tell you today that had it not been for that revival, America would have gone under. But God sent a people who are willing to believe and wait on him that kept America from going under. I believe that the only hope for this country is that men and women, young people, will commit their lives to Christ and say, I'm going to make sure that I'm so building my life, my heart and my home, so that the devil will not be able to gain a toehold and so that we can hold on to the banner of the cross and hold it high that those who are outside in the dark might be able to see him and turn to Christ and be saved. You may be the only thing that's going to keep your neighborhood from going under. You, this church, may be the only thing that's going to hold the line in our world for Jesus. But oh, would it not be wonderful if God would write under our name and in our history 
that in our world, when there's a sinful wind, that we were people who knew how to hold on to God. They have sown to the wind, and they're reaping the whirlwind. If you walk with me day after day, and you hear pink sobs of women who have been abused and homes that are being broken and lives that are being crushed and children whose lives are hanging in the balance both physically and emotionally. If you walk with me and you hear and see, then you want to run somewhere and get in a quiet place and shut the door to the world and get alone with God and pray, Oh God, save my land. There's a sinful wind blowing in the land. If I was a parent and I had young children, I want you to know I'd spend more time with them than I've been doing. I'd pray with them, pray over them, teach them the Word of God. I would sanctify their lives. I'd do everything that I could to make sure that they were saved like this little baby that was baptized tonight and who has the right answers. I want you to know my heart rejoices when I hear that kind of thing. And I'm going to tell you that didn't happen because the ACLU is in favor. It happened because there's a mama that loves God and is pouring her life into her child. You, you need to say in your heart and for God, the world stops at the property line of my home and Satan cannot enter. That is, you need to come and say to God, I'm going to hold the line. I'm not going to give up. But Daddy, everybody else is doing it. So what? Everybody else is going to hell. I'm not going to give you up and let you go. Mama, you ought to live in such a way, clothe yourself in such a way that you teach your child by example and by word how they are to live in this perilous time in which we're living. For you're sending them every day into a war zone and they are going to be attacked in ways you cannot imagine. Brother Shafter said to me yesterday, or Friday, he said, Pastor, the greatest war we have today is not in the high school. It's in the middle school. And he said, if we don't reach them before that time, we will have lost them. And that says to me, we need to get serious about the wind that's blowing in the land. And that low pressure that form begins to feed on a fertile ocean body of water, drawing its strength and sapping the heat. And with every mile that it moves, gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And the sinfulness of our society is such today that we are giving in. And the church is beginning to look like the world. And we have not done a thing, even put on the brakes. There's a sinful wind blowing in the land. Are you going to stand up? Are you going to be counted? Are you going to hold the line? Are you going to be that one who will gather your family around you and pray, God, if the storm hits the house, we're staying here under your protection. Let's pray.